The Land of Shadow is a vast new realm, populated with characters both known and unknown, and landscapes and monuments we've only glimpsed before in artwork and trailers and teasers. And yet, there is something almost, but not quite, familiar about it. One can't help but feel the visceral unease of the uncanny valley, where one recognizes the elements of an image, but they are somehow not quite right like a bizarro lands between. There is a great towering tree which leaks precious golden sap, except it's not the Erd tree. From atop a cliffside, a cathedral dedicated to the Divine Hand overlooks the surrounding lowlands and houses a carrion, except, well, it's not the Manus Celis Cathedral, it's Manus Metir. The closer one looks at the monuments and archaeology, the very structure of the Land of Shadow, the more one recognizes elements from the main game. And eventually, all those monocle moments accumulate to convince a tarnished archaeologist that there are many things that bind the Land of Shadow to our familiar lands between. But how, exactly? What and where is the Land of Shadow? How does it fit in with our archaeological investigations in the lands between? And most importantly, what does its hidden past tell us about the grand open questions of Elden Ring? By now, after two months, the declarative facts of this new land have been uncovered and thoroughly poured over. But beneath that first layer of item descriptions and dialogue, hidden in stone reliefs and buried architecture, lie some of the biggest revelations of the DLC. So pack up your gear, boys and girls, bring your dustpans, brushes, and pickaxes, and get ready for a deep dive into some curious details, so that we may finally unearth some answers. Welcome to our first expedition to the Land of Shadow. Today we begin with a story about death, and about the world that came before the Erd Tree, and about one of the most important and yet still unnamed characters in this world story. Unraveling that story begins, curiously enough, by noticing nothing more than some chisel work on an out-of-place tower. Death is everywhere in Elden Ring, and nowhere more so than in the Land of Shadow. Case in point, from the very first moments after we touch the Withered Arm, we emerge onto the Gravesite Plain, a stunning and otherworldly testament to the salience of death in this place. Spectral gravestones cover the landscape, further blurring the line between the spirit and the physical worlds, and ornate tomb effigies, monuments to death, dot our view. From down below on the plain, we can see the suppressing pillar. The approach to which is guarded by rows upon rows of gravebirds, ghost flame wielding golems made in the image of the deathrite birds, and unmistakable vestiges of a prior pre Erd tree order of death. The pillar itself is an odd structure, to say the least. Standing alone atop a promontory, its function and context initially quite mysterious. Close inspection of the pillar reveals that it derives from the ancient dynasty, as it has the same iconography as seen on the dynasty's great obelisk. Here we have our first inkling of a hidden relationship between the Land of Shadow and the Lands Between. And atop the pillar we find one of the most intriguing lines of text in the entire game. Etched upon a simple stone plaque reads, The very center of the Lands Between. All manners of death wash up here, only to be suppressed. A curious and telling declaration for just what exactly does it mean for death to wash up here? How exactly does death even wash up? 
The pillar itself has no internal structure. It has no reliefs or texts, like, say, Trajan's Column, that would tell its story. In fact, this pillar has no obvious function at all, other than it being a high point along a promontory. Which, in a way, actually makes its function clear. It's a lookout tower for those waiting for death to wash up. Perhaps that is what is meant by the Gravebird's armor, which tells us that they guard the spirit graves where all manners of death ultimately drift. And just what were they guarding against? One needs only to direct their gaze down to the coastline, where death might wash up, and the mystery begins to reveal itself. From atop the suppressing pillar, we can see clearly the smattering of, what can only be described as shipwrecks, dotting the Cerulean coast. No doubt this is partially what is meant by death washing up here, another classic case of FromSoft being deceptively literal. But closer inspection of these would-be ships reveals a more complex narrative. First things first, let's establish that while these structures are made in the form of ships, something we discussed at length in our pre-DLC video, the actual function is a mortuary one. The clearest evidence for this is in their in-game designation. They are simply called stone coffins. So evidently they are coffins made in the image of ships. Something that may seem perplexing at first, but which actually has quite a long and fascinating history in both the real world and in Elden Ring. It is this history which we need to understand if we're going to decipher the nature of death in the Land of Shadow. The association between water and death is one of those recurring ideas across many cultures and historical epochs. To take just one example, the ancient Greeks and Romans believed a river separated the world of the living from the world of the dead, and would bury their dead with offerings to the ferryman who would take the souls of the dead across this river Styx into the underworld. The name of this ferryman, by the way, is Charon. So yeah, you can bet we'll return to him later on. But even beyond merely the general association between death and water, many cultures from ancient China and Japan to Europe developed funerary rituals that involved literally burying their dead inside of boats. Perhaps the most well-known of these practices, of course, would be the Vikings, or their cousins around the North Sea, the Anglo-Saxons. In 1939, an English noblewoman named Edith Pretty hired an archaeologist to investigate the largest of the numerous suspicious mounds dotting her estate hoping to find, of course, buried treasure. And what they found was one of the most stunning discoveries in the history of archaeology. Buried beneath the mound was a 90-foot-long ship, containing all kinds of treasure, including, incidentally, a golden belt buckle, which is probably the inspiration for the jar design seen in the Land of Shadow. But what they found next was even more stunning. The buried ship was a funerary monument, a coffin, if you will, for an unknown Anglo-Saxon. Likely a king, based on the size of the ship and the wealth with which he was buried. And while this is no doubt the most famous example of ship burial in the region, the practice was actually quite common, and lasted for hundreds of years. The Vikings especially were prolific practitioners of ship burial, and numerous stunning examples have been found around northern Europe and Scandinavia to date. And though it was not always the case, often these boat burials would involve complex rituals ending in setting the boat, and everything inside along with it, aflame. A kind of spectacular cremation reserved only for the most prominent members of these societies. Ibn Fadlad's account of his encounter with the Volga Vikings tells of the extensive alcohol-fueled party-slash-funeral-slash-horror show that culminated in the buried man being placed in a boat and set aflame by his kinsmen, along with grave goods and a poor sacrificial slave girl. 
Such was the way that the Volga Vikings sent their kinsmen to the afterlife, inside of a great burning ship. Elden Ring draws clear inspiration from this real-world practice. True, there are funerary rituals of all types. This is a FromSoft game after all. Never has a studio been so obsessed with death and dying. But throughout the Lands Between, and especially in the older strata of this world, there are numerous examples of ship burial. Deep in the forgotten underbelly of Stormvale Castle, for example, in a chamber lined with ghost flame torches, there is a humble site of ship burial. The Tibia Mariners ferry the dead in their spectral boats, just like Caron would. Inside Mesmer's Fort, ceremonial fires burn within boats. In Enir Elim, Wood carvings, actually based off of an Egyptian real-world artifact, are seen clearly showing a funerary procession on a riverboat. And in a way, the game's curious insistence on using coffins to navigate the subterranean river systems is likely a reflection of this boat burial practice. Coffins float down, or even upstream, with a little magical help, reflecting the ancient practice of ship burial. The sheer volume of coffins found in the underground river systems attests to the extent of this practice. And of course, finally, we return to the most impressive version of boat burial, the stone coffins of the Cerulean coast. The description of the mass of putrescence, acquired from the putrid flesh which oozes from these coffins, states, quote, in an age long past, death was burned by ghost flame. Even the remains of tainted flesh were given equal treatment in death." End quote. This, in combination with the grave birds and the ghost flame dragon nearby, seemed to pretty clearly suggest that the corpses in these stone ship coffins were meant to be burned in ghost flame, as in cremated. But there's an inconsistency here. How exactly do cremated corpses become putrid? Simply put, they don't. Ash does not rot. Instead, we are left with the implication that even if in an age long past, these corpses would have been burnt in ghost flame, for whatever reason here, they weren't. And therein lies the revelation. By the time these bodies were put into the great stone ship coffins, the crematory power of ghost flame was lost. According to the Explosive Ghost Flame spell, quote, In the time when there was no word tree, death was burned in ghost flame. Death birds were the keepers of that fire. End quote. Such was the mortuary practice before the time of America, the Erd tree, and specifically before Erd tree burial. These are topics we've covered in extensive detail in our Catacombs episode, so check that out if you're curious. But the point is, cremation, not interment, was evidently among the dominant practices. Deathbirds wielded the power of ghost flame to burn death, and then they would rake out the ashen remains of the corpses using their poker. But at some point, this practice was lost, as the explosive ghost flame description makes clear. No longer is death burned in ghost flame. This is strictly a pre urd tree practice. This knowledge helps us to date and therefore decipher the story of these stone coffins, as it would seem to imply that they were built before the time of the Erd Tree, in a time when death was still burned in ghost flame. By studying the coffins themselves, we can see that this is indeed the case. As we pointed out even before the DLC was released, the stone coffin ships are depicted on the ancient dynasty obelisk. Here we should shout out Reddit user NPComplete, who has some excellent investigative posts, including one on the connections between the stone coffins and the ancient dynasty. But the point is clear. The stone coffin ships are shown on the ancient dynasty obelisk, right down to the two protrusions which, only now we know, are the horns of a bull. This, by the way, is the antidote for any naysayer who invokes asset reuse 
as an explanation for any intriguing connections in this game. Actually, this is quite the opposite of asset reuse. The developers went out of their way to depict, in two completely different forms and contexts, the same fundamental thing, ships with bowls at the bow. The effort and attention to detail that this requires on their part is kind of mind-boggling, but one thing it is definitely not is simple asset reuse. Anyway, the stone coffins are adorned with bowls, which are also seen in various ancient dynasty reliefs. They are covered in vaguely Mesoamerican iconography, including apparent birds and snakes, as well as some images which appear similar, if not identical, to panels from ancient dynasty tree reliefs. But the key depiction is that of an old, robed man, clutching what appears to be a tablet at his torso. We've seen a variation of this before, none other than the Dynast himself, aka Eldin John, depicted in great monumental form all throughout the ruins of the ancient dynasty, is always shown similarly clutching a tablet. So it would seem fairly definitive then, between the depictions on the obelisk and the depiction of the Dynast himself, that these ship coffins, just like the suppressing pillar, belong to the culture of the ancient dynasty. That certainly jives with the previous point we made about them dating to a pre-Erdtree culture, when Ghost Flame was still wielded to burn death. But there is more here to tell. If this is indeed the dynast, then there are some intriguing differences here to discuss. Here, unlike his depiction in the main game, he has no roots growing from within him, suggesting a lack of association with sacred trees. And most intriguingly of all, he has only one tablet. Instead of the usual depiction, which shows him with the discarded, broken tablet at his feet and embracing the depiction of the sacred tree, here we see there is no second tablet. The implication seems to be that this is before his conversion to the faith of the tree, when he still believed in the power of Ghost Flame. That is why he has no roots growing from him. He has no second tablet. He is still clutching to the first tablet. What this tablet shows is, at this point in his life, the only world the Dynast has ever known. The world as it was before the arrival of the Great Tree. It shows the map of the world, with a great city on the banks of a river at its center. It shows the map of the world, Babylon style. The Imago Mundi. The tablet lying discarded at the Dynast's feet perfectly matches a real-world artifact known as the Imago Mundi, also called the Babylonian world map. The oldest map of the world it was found in the late 19th century near the east bank of the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq, and dates to likely the Neo-Babylonian period. If you're having trouble remembering the Neo-Babylonians, think of Nebuchadnezzar sacking Jerusalem and deporting its inhabitants to Babylon, a story told often in the Hebrew Bible and a truly foundational moment in the Jewish religion. The tablet shows, simply put, the Babylonian conception of the world. Near its center is Babylon itself, with other cities depicted as well, all surrounded by the Great Salt Sea. Dotting the edges are the great mountain ranges beyond the sea. The city of Babylon, and indeed most of the map, is bisected by the Euphrates River one of the two great rivers between which civilization, in the west at least, was first formed, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The world's first cities, the first writing, the first complex bureaucracy, all of this began here, in the land between the two rivers, or as the Greeks would phrase that, Mesopotamia. And as it happens in Elden Ring, there is just such a land, an ancient land that lies between two great rivers. An ancient land which once served as the cradle of civilization, but is now only found in ancient tablets and ruins. Underneath the lands between run the two great rivers of the Shifra and Ainsel. Just like their real-world counterparts, the Tigris and Euphrates, they share a headwaters. 
The Tigris and Euphrates both originate in the Taurus Mountains of Anatolia. Then they diverge only to once again join before emptying into the Persian Gulf, or as the Babylonians would call it, the Lower Sea. Likewise, the Ain Sol and Shifra both emerge from a common headwaters in the deep root depths, according to the map description of the area, before taking diverging paths to their version of the Lower Sea. The Ain Sol takes a western route beneath Lyarnia, where the Ul and Uld ruins dot its course, while the Shifra takes a more eastern course, along which the ruins of the ancient dynasty mausoleum and Grand Viaduct now lay. But you'll notice that if this parallel to ancient Mesopotamia is to hold, we're missing the actual Miso part, the portion between the two rivers. The land between the rivers is, well, missing. You can probably see where we're going with this, but for the sake of completeness, let's return to our old friend, the Suppressing Pillar, and the text found atop it, which reads, quote, the exact center of the lands between, end quote. Not of the land of shadow, but of the lands between. This description directly confirms Miyazaki's interview in which he stated that the land of shadow used to be a part of the lands between, but then became physically separated. If we reverse that separation by overlaying the maps, using the suppressing pillar as our axis mundi, so to speak, and scaling it to roughly overlay the shadow tree with its golden counterpart, this jigsaw is almost complete. The missing part of the story, the enigmatic cradle of civilization, now lies in the land of shadow. Before it was called the land of shadow, it was called, according to the two-headed turtle talisman, the land of the tower. The land of the tower, so named for the monumental work of its people, who, like the story of the mythical Tower of Babel, built a tower rising up to the gods. In fact, now that we mention it, the story of the Tower of Babel is based, most likely, off of Entmenanki, the great towering ziggurat of Babylon. Yes, the very same Babylon that lies at the heart of the Imagomundi. The Babylonians, too, built a tower that rose up to the gods, in fact, the very name Babylon even derives from the Akkadian Babalim, which literally means Gate of the Gods. In Sumerian, this would be Kadinger, as in the Kadinger Sanctum, for any Doom 2016 fans out there. But isn't it interesting, then, that atop Anir Elim, which in Akkadian means the Lord's Gate or Lord's House, there is indeed a Gate of the Gods or as the game calls it, a divine gateway. We could go on, but at this point, there can be no doubt that the culture of the tower is based heavily on real-world Mesopotamian culture and history. With that in mind, let's put the puzzle pieces together. Long before the Erd Tree, when the people of the tower still belonged to the lands between, death was burned in ghost flame and at least in part, in boat burial cremations, just like the one in Ibn Fadlad's account. The dead would be put into boats and set ablaze before being floated downriver. Presumably, they were guided along the river by the Tibia Mariners, and their leader, Charon, who, like the real-world Charon, would ferry their souls to the underworld. Indeed, if we track the courses of these two rivers, it's entirely plausible that that's how the stone coffins ended up here on the Cerulean coast. Just like the suppressing pillar says, all manners of death wash up here. Vestiges of this cultural practice can still be faintly seen in the lands between, in the long forgotten underbelly of Stormvale, or in the coffins we use to navigate the underground riverways. This practice was evidently so common that one day, when the crematory power of the ghost flame was lost, perhaps due to the sealing of destined death, or perhaps due to the death of Kauron himself, the bodies in the river coffins, rather than being burned to ash, were instead left to rot. Over time they accumulated, eventually providing ample sustenance for the infestation of man-eating ants feeding on their corpses, 
Now we know why those ants drop Newman runes upon death. They have gorged themselves on the unburnt refuse of the prior age. And this inability to properly cremate the dead helps to explain the mystery with which we started this episode. The putrescence leaking from the stone coffin ships tells us quite clearly that, though the bodies were meant to be burned in ghost flame, like the item descriptions tell us, they were not properly cremated, and instead festered and became putrid, both physically and spiritually impure. We'll leave it to others to explain the Shinto concept of Kagare, but let's just say that FromSoft has a long history of including such thematic and narrative elements in their games. The presence of the ancient dynasty iconography on these ships tells us unambiguously of their shared origins. But at some point, there was a switch, a conversion of sorts. The dynast, initially depicted as carrying the Babylonian world map, is eventually shown discarding this conception of the world in favor of worship of a great tree. By this point, he is also shown with roots growing conspicuously out of him, cementing the conversion, and likely reflecting his devotion to his new faith, much like how the crows in the painted world of Dark Souls have been physically warped by their devotion to Velka. And above all else, the ancient dynasty obelisk shows us this very same transformation. It begins with the stone coffin ships, but then it progresses to sacred tree cultivation, and it ends in the production of new life from these sacred trees. Even if you don't buy that last bit, although we encourage you to watch our video on the topic, the point still remains. Like the statues of the dynast himself, this obelisk shows the conversion of the ancient dynasty, from the age of the stone coffin ships and the power of the ghost flame to the age of the great tree. There is one final point to make, however. While the stone coffins are, no doubt, an extension of the ancient cultural practices of boat burial, it would be a mistake not to point out their differences, their peculiarities. Cultural cousins they may be to the humble, single-person boat burials beneath Stormvale, or of the underground coffins, but they are definitely not the same. They are massive and ornate, and they all washed up specifically here. All of which points to some specific event, some specific catastrophe, in the history of this culture. What catastrophe would lead them to build giant boat-shaped ships to, all at once, go properly into the afterlife? Moreover, what catastrophe would cause the conversion of the dynast? We'll leave you with this thought. In the text of the Imagomundi, there is a reference to Utnapishtum, the Noah equivalent in the Sumerian flood myth. Could it be that, like Utnapishtum or like the biblical Noah, the builders of these massive ships built them in the time of a great flood. And if so, what good would stone ships even be? Just what was covering the lands between upon which stone coffins would float? Well, that, our friends, is a story for another day. <laughs>